possible anxiety over not being able to produce tears, there is a lot going on inside the actor at that moment. Like right. that could feed the story even better than, you know, water rolling down somebody's face. You right. know, it's like what mm-hmm. is truthful is moving and it really transcends the screen and gets through the audience and, and, and people are touched. So, you know, mm-hmm. hopefully you have a director who is open to working with you and seeing what's really going on. And if they really want the tears, and I've had this happen so many times that, okay, I'm not quite going down the same road as the director wants me to. One director, Mario, as a party that I worked with so many times, it's one of my favorites, he had the gift. He would walk up to me and say four words in my ear, and my emotional state would be transformed. Oh, wow. <laughs> he was so good. I mean, I think that's the gift of a director to change, to mold, to, you know, work their actors like clay. And if they're going to yeah. manipulate them, don't let them know they're being manipulated. You know, if, you, if you're yeah. having this communication where you feel like it's a partnership and a teamwork, often they have to manipulate you anyway. But I had one director once who was very manipulative and not very good at it, and it just made me mad, which got in the way. <laughs> exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Especially <laughs> then I had to really calm down. Mm-hmm. Right. I, well, I had to cry, but I, I'd been crying all day for everybody else's coverage. It was my very first job called Miles to Go, and I'd never acted before. And... I had modeled, and the model, the talent rep at the modeling agency had sent me out on this call and told them that I could act. And I thought, well, you know, in the movie, my mother's dying of cancer, so if I cry and say the words right, maybe they'll look at me twice. Mm -hmm. So every time I went and every time I got really into it and imagined it was my own mother, and I cried and I said the words. So each time I cried and said the words, seven callbacks, cried and said the words. They hired me, flew me to Montreal to shoot it, still had cold feet, had me do another screen test while I was there. So I just kept doing it. Finally, the day comes for this big scene, and they did Jill Clayburgh's coverage first. She played my mother, and so I cried mm-hmm. for her. And then they did the little boy's coverage. She played my younger brother, and I cried for him. And they turned around on, on my coverage, and the director was afraid that I was all cried out. Uh-huh. And I wasn't. So he walked by me, and he pushed me. <gasps> like he what? physically shoved me. And oh I was so shocked and so startled. Like, I was, like, really green, young actor. Like I said, never acted before, never planned on acting. And this man was trying to do one of those manipulations to upset me when all it did was really make me upset and angry, like, upset right. in a different way. And then, mm-hmm. I, you know, the care and makeup team had to take me aside, like the people that you trust, and they had to calm me down and so I could finally get back into it and, and calm down being shoved by someone. I was so shocked. And then oh I cried. God. Then I yeah. cried again for their coverage. But I, I thought, you know, how dare you? I just, <laughs> I never yeah. thought. Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, that would have been my initial reaction, too, if somebody shoved me. I mean, that just didn't make any sense whatsoever. It Maybe really it worked didn't. with some people, but I, I can't it see it working for myself either. No, I wasn't terribly impressed. But No. <laughs> No, you were when you were a model, you went to Japan for a while and you learned how to speak some Japanese. Do you still remember it? Yeah, do you know I only remember one phrase, it's been so long. It's been so long. We <laughs> learned Japanese so easily there because you needed it. Like if you had mm-hmm. to look up where's the bathroom in your in your translation book, you only had to look it up once or twice to remember it. It was a need to know basis. Mm-hmm. So that is, you know, I said I only remember one phrase, but, uh, phrase, but I remember this too. It's a toilet with okodeska. So it's like, you know, they called it the toilet. And where is it with okodeska? The question. Oh. Um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, the, well, the phrase. That's a the very most, important phrase to have to it remember. Is. <laughs> and, you know, things like how much does this cost? And may I have mm-hmm. the receipt? Uh, the receipt was Yoshi Shokurusai. And, um, but the phrase that I remember was Kiyonoshi Shino Kute Kurusai. Hai, arigashimasu. Which oh my I believe gosh. meant, can I please have the pictures? Would you send me the pictures from today's shoot? <laughs> because oh. we all needed the pictures, you know. And yeah, we had to yeah. depend on them in those days. It was um, 84, I went for two months. And over 85, 86, I went for four months. And so it was not the digital age. And we had to rely on the, the magazines to send right. the tear sheets to our agents so that we could put them in our, in our modeling portfolios, in our books. Yeah, and being so far away, you know, you definitely need to get them before you go back, if if at all possible, so that way you know you have exactly. them. 
Exactly. No, it was imperative. <laughs> but you know, you got lucky sometimes and you didn't other times. But that was the time of my life. I I loved it. Well, I had a lot of lucky times in my life. I've a lot of examples springing to mind. <laughs> right. But no, I had a great time. I had a great, great, great time. How different is it there from the U.S.? Astoundingly different, or it was. I don't know what's going on now. As I said, it's been mm-hmm. a very long time. But at the time, I, if I walked down the street and babies looked at me, they would cry and dogs barked. They what? cried and dogs barked. Like, who is this? thing that looks like this that's so different. Well, being blonde and everything, too, I yeah. guess, it would where you throw them off. Yes, yes. It was very, very different. And um, there are things I absolutely love about the culture, and then there are things that were so different from the Western culture that I grew up in that I had to remind myself that I'm a visitor here and this is, you know, not my culture and to respect that. Mm-hmm. Because it was just very different and not the way we did things at home. And, and I, you know, didn't love everything about it. But then there were so many things about the Japanese culture that I loved so much. And and beautiful, beautiful aspects of their culture, the, the temples and the, the people. I mean, it really was a very, very safe place to go as an 18-year-old who'd never been away from home. Yeah, yeah. So That makes it frightening sometimes. There were still places where we were told not to go, you know, places mm-hmm. where obviously you know you should you just shouldn't go but in general it was it was a very very safe place for me to be you know off to (laughs) on my own yeah (laughs) (laughs) well um you you know this is shifting gears a little bit but you currently have two films in post-production and one being the carrie remake oh yeah and uh and talk a little bit about this um i mean i'm excited about this because gosh anytime you take a movie and you remake it into modern day it's always neat to see, you know, how it's recreated, but is it is it very similar to the original version, or are there a lot of new things being added? Well, you know what, I can't exactly address that, because I saw the original version years and years and years ago, scared the pants off me, and, uh, mm-hmm. and then I didn't want to revisit that when I auditioned, and then when I got the part, you know, I didn't want anybody else's version of my character to get in my head. Mm-hmm. So I did not uh, rewatch it. I will at some point, but I haven't yeah. yet. So uh, I only know the material that we were dealing with, which I, I believe was very similar, but I don't know um, what exactly the, um, you know, the script or the the brilliant director was putting in, you know, Kimberly Pierce, who I was so incredibly honored and thrilled to work with. You know, she's a very big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, to get to work with Julianne Moore, it was just so lovely for me. It was, you know, I mean, I haven't been doing this for a long time, but I am absolutely, like, I am not worthy to work with certain people, and, and Julianne Moore is definitely one of them. It was a great day. It was an amazing oh, day. <laughs> I love you both. <laughs> no, and thank you. Oh, she's incredible. Just to watch the way she interacted with, with Kimberly and, and, uh, so the way she works, and oh my gosh, she's just one. They're all they're wonderful. They're wonderful. It was very exciting for me. Very exciting. Although you know they did what they always do. They always always change your lines, and you go in very very prepared. And I I don't know if you guys. I had a really really big car accident a long time ago. It was in 1988, and my memory was damaged. So before that, I used to memorize a script, reading it once, maybe twice, and I'd know my lines and everybody else's lines. And then it was. It was my task to try not to remind others of their lines when they forgot them because I just had such a great memory for lines. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. And after my car accident, I had to work very hard to remember my lines, I think, as probably most people do. But um, it, I really had a, a severe memory problem after my car accident, I guess severe concussion or whatever, but I couldn't talk. I didn't remember how to say, you know, the word for table or chair or knife or fork. I had oh to remember God. all of that. Yeah, it was pretty dramatic. Um, So when I go on set, and as they do so often, it's not an anomaly. It's not a surprise. They change the lines. They go, you know, we're adding a bit here. We're doing a bit there. They change it in the working of. And then, you know, I'm just trying to keep my inner panic completely at bay and not look like an amateur. You know, it's like I was prepared. Now I have to memorize this really, really quickly, which is a challenge for me. Um, mm-hmm. and incorporate the new things that they're doing and incorporate the way Julianne is doing her, you know, her side of it. And 
I don't know. It was uh, it was a very exciting day. It was a challenging day, and I cannot wait to see which which scenes which uh, takes they chose. Well, one thing that I have always been you know very intrigued by is as a viewer of of horror films, you know, it'll it'll scare the pants off of you almost. But what is it like to actually be in a horror film and and act out the scenes that are supposed to, you know, come across as being very frightening to the average viewer? Well, let me see how can I answer that question. Um, first of all, I can't give anything away. I mean, you know that I did a scene with Julianne Moore. That's not giving any plot things away. Um, so sure. I can't, I won't address it with Carrie, uh, sure. which then makes me talk about other horror films that I've done. And really, I've only done comedy horror. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that's a little different. Um, you know, Prom Night 3 and The Brain were not, <laughs> really scary movies. <laughs> They're really scary mm-hmm. movies, and that's the point. Um, you know, the brain, the brain grows to mammoth proportions and eats a town. And so, you know, the guy that I'm working with at one point, you know, puts his head inside the big rubber brain, and then they shoot another shot where his feet and his sticking out would put his little running shoes on the snake leg. Yeah. <laughs> it was so, so ridiculous. And then the director comes up to me. Oh, that's one occasion. You talked about crying. The director came up to me and said, it wasn't scripted. He said, okay, now I want you to cry. The the, the brain is breaking into the library where you're hiding in the school, and, and now you have to cry. Oh, God. And uh, <laughs> I think I was a little saucy, and I said to him, okay, you get one take of me crying. <laughs> yeah. one take. And they put, I don't know how I did it, they put the slate up. Do you know what a slate is? It's that clapperboard thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They put the slate up in front of my face and, and slapped it, and I cried for one take, and then they cut, and I went, that's all you get. Yeah. <laughs> and then we went back <laughs> to the ridiculousness of this fun comedy horror, just absolute silliness, right? But that's it. It's mm-hmm. incredibly tongue-in-cheek, and, and I just didn't want to be running around and then crying every day because it's incredibly taxing emotionally. Right. Right. It's draining. It's exhausting. It's why you know I've done so many of these lifetime movies where I'm the you know poor, poor not well woman who decides to you know kill either her ex or someone she has her eye on and thinks should be her ex or something. I don't know. Right. But I've done so many of them where I have to cry for the whole movie and it's exhausting. And yeah. so I was thrilled with the last two. The the producer Pierre David, who I've done so many projects for. I think the first time we worked together was 1980. Seven. And so we go way back. So he hires me a lot. And sometimes it's for a teeny bit that's a cameo, and other times it's a lead, and then other times it's reporting. And the last two that I've done for him, I got to be the friend of the poor woman who loses her mind. So, like, you know, Sydney Penny gets to cry. I was for the going to movie. say, yes, and, I oh love my that God. movie. I loved it so much. I said I get to act like a man. Nobody yep. expects a guy to cry. You know, you see all these big stars in movies, these guys, and their daughter is kidnapped or their wife is killed, and they look up mm-hmm. tragically, and there's no tears on their face, and nobody says a word. Whereas if you're right. a woman, they'd be like, where are the tears? Right. You know, like, <laughs> so I just had so much, so much fun working with Sydney and Cameron and, and doing doing those movies where I don't have to be this traumatized woman that balls for, you know, the entire movie and every scene. It was like a walk in the park. So I couldn't even believe yeah, it. Yeah, we were rooting for you for different reasons in that movie because you were trying to save your ex, Cameron. So, yeah. <laughs> and Sydney yeah. Penny was the whack job. So. <laughs> yes, yes, I was, I was so pleased. So please not to have to cry. I can't even tell you. It was ridiculous. Yeah. I've had to cry so much in my career. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And it's not usually like on the brain where they just put the clapper up and then you, you do it and you stop. Usually you just have to torture yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, oh, well, it's uh, it's very therapeutic. You really have to, you know, mine, like I said, you have to mine your emotions and figure out what really, what is really meaningful to me. Like, you know, at one point I came across this thought, I realized that my father saved my emotional life because I was adopted. So my father and my mother, you know, I could have ended up anywhere, but I ended up in an amazing family with loving, supportive, wonderful people. And, you know, I could have ended up anywhere. And, you know, so for that moment to strike you to realize, because otherwise you just go about your life and don't really think about that. Exactly. You take it for granted. So there are many things as, as actors that we have to analyze and and look at under a magnifying glass that maybe other people don't really have to do. I have no idea. I don't know if other people 
um, look at things that actually like disturb. I think people mostly try not to think about things that upset them. Like, I think that. 